For those who have been following Swoop, I'm sure you are very aware that we just in the last few weeks, we have released our M365 benchmarking report. Um, this is the first report that we've released for M365, which is very exciting. And alongside that analysis that we've ran, we've sort of found some, some pretty interesting findings, which we're going to be walking through today. Of course, we also wanted to bring in that sort of storytelling element as well um, to be able to show you our best practice at a real organisation and the way that they're using M365 to, to get work done um, and to get work done effectively and efficiently as well. So um, I think Sharon has popped in the chat there. If you'd like to potentially introduce yourselves, let us know where you're joining us from, uh, what organisation you work for. We'd love to keep the chat super active throughout today's session. If you have questions as we're going through with the findings or as we get towards the sort of Q&A section of today, we'd love to hear from you, um, even to hear about the way things are working in your organisation and potentially how you could use some of the insights from our benchmarking report to uh, inform what you're doing from, from today. And I think we actually even have some really great, great uh, tips and tricks to share as well, some actionable things that you can take straight after today's session and, and use that to, to work more effectively within your teams as well. So in saying that, before we get into the content for today's session, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this online session is being hosted. Um, I'm joining from the central coast of New South Wales, so I'd like to acknowledge the Dungjung people. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge the uh, traditional custodians of the lands where all of our participants are located today. Uh, and I also want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and of course, extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are present on today's session as well. Um, we have a jam-packed agenda as we always do for these sessions. Um, so, of course, just a few quick welcomes and introductions to kick us off. Uh, we love running some audience polls to see what you're thinking about uh, when it comes to M365 in your organisation and maybe the challenges that you're currently facing. Uh, then I'll be handing over to Laurie, who will be taking us through the key findings from the M365 benchmarking report. I'm very aware that many of you have probably already downloaded the report. But you would also notice that it is a very in-depth, intense report. So today is probably your best way to get that um, sort of quick, um, up, uh, getting you up to speed on those key findings direct from the report authors. You can ask your questions today. And then, of course, please go through and read the full report when you do get the opportunity to. Um, we'll also be recognising our M365 collaboration champions. So if you are familiar with our previous benchmarking reports, you'll know that we also announce winners of collaboration awards every single year, which we've been running for Yammer and Microsoft Teams. And now we also get to acknowledge the organisations and uh, groups of people who are doing a great job on M365. Uh, we also have David Fogarty from uh, Engage Square joining us today. Um, and I guess a bit of a spoiler alert that Engage Squared were one of the sort of top performing um, uh, case studies that we were able to uh, identify as a part of our analysis this year. So we have a bit of a Q&A with David as well to learn about what best practice looks like at Engage Square. Uh, and then, of course, we'll try and make sure we have some time for some audience Q&A. But please, as I said, keep the chat active throughout today's session. We'd love to hear from you. Lots of questions is what we love to see. Um, and just a very quick introduction as well for some of our fabulous presenters we have on today's session. Of course, I mentioned we have Dr. Lawrence Lockley from Swoop Analytics, who will be walking through those key insights from the benchmarking study. Also a massive part of pulling together the benchmark report, completing all of the analysis, writing the report. Um, and also we have Sharon Dawson from Swoop Analytics, who leads up all of our external relations and comms at Swoop. And Sharon is the key part in bringing those stories to you about how organisations uh, are using M365 and Teams and Yammer for our other reports as well. Um, Sharon gets the stories to you and helps to sort of inspire you with those findings from, from our customers as well. And as I mentioned before, we have David Vogarty from Engage Squared, who is a senior information technology project manager. And David has some really great tips and insights, uh, which I'm sure you'll be able to take away straight after today's session. 
we have a bit of a poll to get you started. So if I could get you to grab your device or you can probably open it up on your um, on your desktop as well. Uh, if you want to use the QR code or alternatively, you can head to menti.com and there's a code there up on the screen, which you'll be able to access in just a moment as I move across into Menti as well. So if you miss it, you'll still be able to access it. Code being 2269-0236. And we're wanting to find a little bit out about your organisations and what the biggest digital collaboration sins that you're currently facing are. Uh, so I'm just going to navigate across into Menti now. So I hope you've all had the opportunity to grab that QR code. Uh, if I just jump out of here now and across into Menti. We already have some results coming through, so I know that you've all been able to access it. If you still need that code and you're just jumping in now, if you'd like to jump to menti.com, and then we have a code here at the top of the screen that you can use. And these uh, different collaboration SINs, if you're familiar with Swoop for M365, and I know we've got a few on the call here today that are currently using Swoop for M365 in your organisations, these SINs are all lining up with those Swoop 7 collaboration habits. So looking at things like email overload, meeting overload, uh, you know, how much are you over relying on chat? Um, you know, what's the balance of using SharePoint versus OneDrive? Um, are you using enterprise social to connect people across your organisation, whether that be workplace, whether that be Yammer? Um, camera on and off in online meetings. Sometimes there's a there's an interesting sort of cultural conversation around that within organisations. If you have your camera switched on or not, great to see a few people with your cameras on today. So hello, nice to see your smiling faces. Uh, and then also around not sharing content in online meetings, which we find brings a bit more purpose and reason to actually spending time on a meeting versus collaborating asynchronously. The results here are definitely reflecting. Um, interestingly, with some of the findings that we'll talk to in just a moment. So email overload and meeting overload seems to be those challenges that are resonating across the board. Uh, and also when you start to look at some of the benchmarking insights, these are some of the uh, collaboration habits which we think have the most room for improvement. Um, interestingly there, we can also see, you know, keeping working files in private spaces coming up as the, the third most um, I guess, common digital sin that we're seeing. Um, so maybe collaborating more in OneDrive or lack of collaborating versus collaborating in the more open spaces like SharePoint. So I think that's an interesting overview of, of where we're at. And thank you for everyone who has participated in that quick audience poll. I'm going to jump back across into our, maybe if I can just make this big on the screen again, just give me one moment. Uh, I'm going to now hand over to Laurie to walk us through the key findings from the M365 benchmarking report. So, Laurie, I'll bring you into the conversation now. Okay, thanks, Emily. Hello, everybody. Uh, so, those of you who are familiar with Swoop and our benchmarking, you know that we don't do surveys. We analyse what people are actually doing by, go, by looking at their, the digital trails they use when they're interacting. Uh, in this case, with the M365, we, we had 18 organisations, sort of over 200,000 accounts, but I'd say that includes guests. So if we take the guests out, we're around about 113,000 accounts, uh, nearly 4,000 groups. So this time we're able to analyse groups as defined in your, your uh, Active Directory. So if you like, it's representative of your, your hierarchy. So if we can move on, Emily, to the next slide, please. I'll just go through. Uh, the key insights, I'll give you these up front. Right? So the, the first one we're calling the all gear and no idea. Now, now really, uh, you know, what we've been flooded with from survey results is that people are overloaded and, and you're actually demonstrating that yourself with meetings and email and so forth. But what we found is that when you look at everybody in the organisation, that's actually not the case. In fact, probably one of the bigger issues is the actual digital disconnected people. What we found was that if you look at meeting time, you know, the, the busiest 10% were accounting for something like 42% of all the time spent in meetings online. Yet when you look at the bottom 50%, they're only occupying 6% of that total. And a high proportion of those people haven't been to a meeting at all in six months, right? online meetings. So there is a big level of 
digital disconnect is out there that is really hidden from from view if you're relying on surveys or even people like your good self coming here. The disconnected don't don't attend webinars either. So the the next finding was that that I guess the two places that we see where the best asynchronous work can happen is in Teams channels and in Yammer. And in fact, we believe that they're woefully underutilized. You know, only 14% of staff have posted anything on Yammer, and only 27% have actually posted in a Teams channel message. So uh, for the Yammer people you know, out there, and we're, we're Yammer fans, you know, the good thing is, and we reported this in the Yammer benchmarking, is that Readership is very high in Yammer, 82%. So that's still, we, we, we were able to keep validating that. Uh, in terms of chat, you know, chat is starting to take over from email. And people are proudly saying, we're not doing so much email now, although your results show that you still are. Uh, a lot of the, them are saying, we're doing chat now. And, and we think that that's actually like jumping from the frying pan into the fire, because all that does is introduce all the bad habits of email and then and then uh, feed steroids to it, you know. so. It's still mainly one-on-one, -on -one. you know, you're still not sharing. And in fact, what you're doing is you're introducing a whole heap of interruptions to people's day and their workflow. So, and there's more of that in the in the report. Now, I, I will say that chat's not bad for everybody. Uh, what the research tells us is that the people you chat with when you in your close network, the people you're working with day-to-day, -day, chat can actually be beneficial. But, you know, if it's broader than that, you know, you're actually interrupting people. So, you know, read that part of the report. I think there's some interesting things around chat. Uh, in terms of uh, the variability in these groups, so what we're able to do is look at groups and individual and, and organisations, in fact, and look at the variations in the habits. Because what we're measuring is, is we have seven digital habits. I probably should have talked about that earlier. But we've designed seven digital habits and they're represented in that Menti, Menti quiz that you just did. And therefore, we measured the habit performance of every individual in the benchmarking study, and we were able to aggregate their results in their groups as defined by their higher position in the hierarchy. So, as I said, we had you know nearly 4,000 groups that we could look at. And what we found was quite a large variation within the teams. But when there wasn't, now I'll actually leave that to a later one because uh, I've got a slide on that. So, Emily, if you could move to the next, the last three. Um, we we attempted to look at the you know as you as you showed in your menti quiz you know the two biggest areas that people were concerned about was email overload and meeting overload and we we're able to calculate based on on some uh, methodologies that we we uh, if you like learnt from both Microsoft and some of our customers about how they're trying to quantify the benefits of time spent in meetings and and email instead of using the asynchronous channels of, of channels or, or Yammer, we found that on average people could save 26 minutes a day if they worked more asynchronously. Now that might not sound a lot, but when you multiply it by everybody in the organization, you know, that equates to something like $70 million a year for an organization with 10,000 uh, people. And you can do the sums yourself on your own organization. It's, it's a big amount and there's a lot that you can save just from those two habits. Uh, we also looked at the leaders. Now, the way we identified the leaders was, was basically the role names. So those organisations have had role names. We just had some keywords that indicated they were, were a manager or a leader. And we took that out. I think there was something like 23% of them had, had titles like that. And we measured their performance versus the non-leaders. And thankfully, the leaders are actually doing better than the non-leaders. Now, I originally felt that might not be the case because often office-bound managers don't feel the need to be digitally competent because they can manage by walking around. But it seems to me that over the last year or two, uh, you know, they've picked up their game because they had to, otherwise they would be irrelevant. You know, if you can't manage virtually in today's world, you know, you're not managing at all. And finally, I guess, and I guess this is a little bit more of a plug for, for the what, what Swoop is doing is that, you know, if you think about the way you're working is a is a habit, a digital habit, you know, it's all about developing better habits. In the same way that you might develop better habits in, in maintaining your health or improving your health, it's the same with digital working. And in the same way with any habit, the best way to improve on a habit is to monitor yourself and monitor how, you, how you're going and improving over time. And that's largely what the Swoop M365 dashboard does. It monitors your habits at both an individual level and as a, at a group level. If we go to the next slide, uh, 
So just to, just to dig down a little bit deeper into here, I've already mentioned this this mismatch between the busiest 10% and the and the disconnected 50%. You know, it said that uh, you know that that 50% is spending less than 15 minutes a day interacting with others, right? So they're not overloaded at all, are they? You know, and 18% did not even participate in a single meeting online over a six month period. You know, some of them may have been frontline workers and so forth, but you know, it's hard to visualize someone. You know, in this day and age, not at least having one call in a six-month period. So, so clearly, there's a a big cohort of people that are being being left out of the discussion at the moment. You can go on to the next slide, Emily. Uh, in terms of um, where do you spend your time? We this is something that that Viva Insights also does, but uh, we we use pretty much some of the same same formulas that they use, and we found that most people spent time reading their email and audio is actually meeting time so the audio measure is actually timed in meetings and calls and of course the email sent follows that up and then you then you're into sharepoint onedrive and so forth but right down the bottom you can see yammer and channels right so you know disaster or woefully underutilized in in our mind in terms of working asynchronously uh next slide emily uh, this slide is really just indicating something about chat and what we found that the, the digital patterns that we're seeing is that we always have that busy 10% and the not busy you know, 50, 60%. It is the same for chat, but there's some people that are incredibly chatty. For like So in essence, the average 65 chat messages uh, a week and, uh, you know, some of those you can see on the chart, some of those are in the thousands of chat messages, you know. Uh, you know, a week. So, so really, there are some you know, people that are chatting far too much. Of course, there's some that aren't chatting at all. They're just digitally disconnected. But in essence, as, as I've already said, you know, chat needs to be used selectively. You know, and and certainly read into the report about where it's best to use. But it can be a major disruption to productivity. Next slide, Emily. Okay, this is becoming our star slide. <laughs> we get lots of comments about this slide. And I must say, what what I've done here is I've plotted all of well, 3,600 groups you can see there. I've plotted their collaborative performance. So that's the that's basically the average of all of the individuals in those groups, uh, which is one dot against the variation uh, within that group. And you can see this interesting boomerang pattern where low variation happens both in high performance and low performance. Now, uh, what's happening here? Uh, when I looked at the low performance ones, you know, they were united in the fact they didn't do anything, right? So the digitally disconnected are actually, you know, they're unified by the inactivity. But right at the top, this is where we have our stars and some of the groups that we interviewed, including, including David Fogarty, Fogarty's uh, awesome group, was up there. These people, all of the members have high, you know, have good digital digital habits. And that's what they're unified around, good digital habits. So. They're the ones right at the top. Now, the interesting thing is this implied journey that happens, you know, and you can nearly read, well, I have actually read a story into this data by saying, as you move up in your performance, uh, your the variation in your group becomes larger because what you find is that some group members start to get it and start to work better, but there's always laggards in the group that, you know, refuse to move or just aren't interested or what have you. So you've got this frustrating period where you've got some leaders and laggards trying to sort of work together. But there is a point, and I'm suggesting that point is around the 50% mark, where the leaders start to get the critical mass going, and then it starts to become more a peer and peer and shaming type thing. So in essence, you, you can move your way back up as more members learn how to work more proficiently and digitally. Now, I think what this is telling us is the approach, uh, an approach to training that's probably a lot different to what people are doing now, you know, rather than sheep dipping every individual in technical courses on how to use M365, and our belief is that we should be training people within their groups because they need that peer pressure to, to move themselves along. Certainly for down the bottom, you know, there's a good amount of education and training required, you know, because nobody is doing anything very well. But once you start moving up that curve, then then the task changes. The, the education is all more about helping the leaders to influence the laggards within their groups, using different gaming techniques or what have you to try and get people to 
to, to develop similarly good habits as they move up. And so I think this is a fairly important sort of insight here that we're seeing in terms of how organisations can actually educate uh, their, their workforce in digital working, especially in this, this hybrid uh, situation that's certainly not going away. So uh, next, um, next slide, Emily. So uh, as I said before, we decided that we would do this sort of quick win thing about the two most important things. As you can see, the asynchronous collaborator, which is about meeting overload, and the email liberated, which is about email overload. And just simply by replacing, you know, at least a proportion of those emails, and we're saying 20%, which I think is pretty conservative, 50% uh, of meeting time, this is something I got, got from the literature. There was a lot of articles I saw where people felt meeting time could at least be reduced by 50%. You know, so if we took those two numbers and we did the calculations about how much time it takes to spend to send a, a channel message versus an email and so forth, it adds up to big money. So if you look at the report, you'll actually we actually define the, the formula. You know, we'll acknowledge our uh, one of the inputs from that is one of our customers. He called himself the the nerd from Atlanta, but we can't mention who he worked for, but it was a very big company. And he 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 actually had done this sort of work, and we we drew from his work as well as some of the sort of calculations that Microsoft had provided as well. So you know, there's some there's some pretty quick wins that you can go with the business case to get started you like. Next one, Emily, if there's any more. Uh, leaders. Okay, I talked about leaders. I, I mentioned, you know, you can see there what the keywords were that we picked up. You know, 12,000 uh, leaders, 36,000 non-leaders. And as I said, the, you know, the performance was higher. The variation in their performance was lower. It was a good story for leaders, as I said. But as I said, there still is a variation. So not all your leaders are going to be good. So, but nevertheless, they're on the right track, and I think that's a very positive thing to take forward. And certainly, modelling leaders modelling behaviour is going to be a very big thing in terms of how we sort of encourage people to work more efficiently in the, in the hybrid world. So, next one, Emily. And finally, sort of the analytics that are required. I mean, I, I won't talk to this because Emily is actually going to do a little demo at the end, but it'll show you how you can actually ma manage and monitor analyze and monitor your your own digital habits and the digital habits of your team and organization in fact uh, by using swoop for m365 so i think that's is that the end for me emily what's next uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's over to sharon oh hi hi everyone um so we've got to introduce and announce the M365 collaboration champions in our data. So we um, analyze, as Laurie said, 18 organizations in the benchmarking analysis, and that equated to 3,773. We call them like departments. They're usually teams. They could be groups. And the reason we looked at these um, individual departments or teams um, was because I'm sure you're seeing it in your organisation, there's such a huge variation. You may have some really high performing ones, but many low performing ones as well. And part of the um, benefit, I think, of doing swoop benchmarking is we can identify those high performing teams and hopefully then, you know, you can showcase those within your organisation. Um, but in the benchmarking report, we might move on to the winners, Emily. Um, these were some of our winners from our 2022 M365 benchmarking. Um, so we've got case studies in the report. Oh, oh lots of claps there. <laughs> case studies in the report from all these organisations. Um, one of the ones that you are probably familiar there is RACQ. And I saw there was somebody in the chat who said they're from RAA, which is the South Australian equivalent of RACQ. Um, and they were actually a good example um, of finding, uncovering one of their top performing teams. And I found this interesting, that top performer was actually retail stores. So these are the frontline workers in the stores for RACQ. Um, and the way that they're working really well is because they're spread right across Queensland, which we know is an enormous state geographically. And um, but they're actually all communicating and connecting just using M365 tools. So for them to be one of the top performers I found was was really impressive. So um, 
if you are interested in doing any benchmarking, in, you can just sign up with SWIP. We've got a Yammer one coming up, um, which we've just opened participation for, or next year's M365. Everything can be anonymous. We wouldn't even name your names in, in this example and, unless we had approval. But it is a really good way of uncovering some of those top performing teams that are happening within your organisation already. So um, if, you, if you want to read these case studies, I think the benefit of doing them is just trying to learn what works for other organisations organizations and seeing if that might work for you guys as well. So go ahead and share those and then we'll move on to talking with David um, and David Fogarty is joining me now and David's the Senior Information Technology Project Manager or one of them at Engage Squared which was a which is actually a Microsoft Partner of the Year. So when David and I are chatting please just jump in either unmute yourself and ask questions if you've got questions for David or just put them in the chat and I'll try and keep an eye on them those as well. So one of the teams David um, is part of is called, it's the project management team, uh, but sorry, project management office, which we think quite aptly goes by the name Team Awesome. And they were one of the top three teams from the 3,773 analysed. Um, and they were actually, last year we did a huge Microsoft Teams benchmarking. And I've got to say that Team Awesome was also uh, one of the top teams in the Teams benchmarking as well. So they are certainly um, doing lots of best practices. So David and his colleague Ruby, they shared their best practices in a case study in the report, which you'll find and in the report. And I'll actually share the link with you soon because it's on the website as well. When we were interviewing David, one of the things that jumped out to me was the fact, David, that you don't have Outlook installed on your desktop. So to check email, you have to open Outlook in the browser. And you were telling us that this was a de deliberate decision. David, can you explain more? Why do you not have Outlook on your computer? Simply put, I got myself a new Mac and I didn't want to overload the machine with more apps. So um, it then gave me the choice that I choose when I look at email, sometimes not fast enough, uh, but my focus is by project, by customer, or by activity in the channel and email gets its time a couple of times a day not constantly pinging in my ear. I hope does that sound good for anybody else not to have email constantly interrupting your days you might actually one of the other case studies in the report it was from a company called Syngenta which is one of the world's largest agriculture companies and um, you'll see there's a screenshot in there and she actually only has her inbox open for an hour a day so this little note saying you know my inbox is open from 8 a.m to 9 a.m monday to thursday um, otherwise get me on chat and uh, there's some really great examples I think, David, that probably resonates with you. I'll always have the tab open during office yeah. hours, but it doesn't always get my attention. Yeah, yeah. Well, David, let's go into, Emily, if you can move to the next slide, This we might have some visuals that can, you can help explain this, David. But can you just walk us through what best practice looks like when you're working on M365? And this is, I guess, this is talking more about um, Teams. So this little screen grab is an internal team and I see Dolly and Brittany from this team are actually on the call with us. Oh, uh, a couple of things that are helpful, uh, little icons beside each channel. So visually if you are looking for something there's a clue in the sea of words that are the list of teams and channels on that left hand side of your Teams app. Uh, and I, for instance, will post into resources with a question um, I, or a suggestion of uh, screen grabs were something we cared about very recently. And that was the place to go and ask the question. Uh, I didn't expect an immediate answer, but I knew the next time one of our change consultants looked at it, their mind is in the right space to answer the question before they've even read whatever I've typed. Mm -hmm. Positioning the brain for what's happening um, helps an awful lot. Yeah, interesting. Um, and then I know we've got some just some notes on the right hand side of this screen now, David, but can you just 
walk us through. So you obviously, as a project manager, you're dealing with clients all the time and you have a really set formula of how you work. And I think one of the keys that Ruby especially was saying, it's very much about being transparent from the get go and getting people on board. And we've got some notes there, but can you just walk us through what does it look like when you're starting out with a new client? So with a new client and hello to some of the current clients and past clients on the call, um, we will set up um, an internal channel before we have the first session with the customer. Uh, if it's a repeat project with the customer, we're really happy and the there'll be a new channel per project or engagement. Uh, and from housekeeping of where's the contract, what have we actually agreed with the customer, it's uh, a top tab on the channel. And then we'll have the kickoff meeting with the customer and almost every project we kick off we ask the customer would you like us to create a team and we work together there or are you happy to do that um, different customers have different reasons for an answer but from project kickoff we've set the expectation that we'd prefer to communicate using the tool and the platform is there um, really big projects will sometimes go to multiple channels per project because uh, not everyone needs to see everything, uh, but it is ingrained from the start of the engagement. And uh, where with a project as a project manager with many customers on the go, if my brain's thinking, uh, I'm going to call RAA out again, uh, working with Anne, uh, my brain is in the right zone to deal with either what has Anne left for me or what am I sending her and it's front of mind and also stops me sending stuff from a different customer in the wrong space and I don't think I have done that yet but I know I have auto completed emails <laughs> in the past to the wrong party. I think Chantel, Chantel, have you got a question or was that just putting your hand up to say, yeah, I've sent the wrong stuff to the wrong client? No, definitely, definitely not. Never done that in my life. <laughs> I just, just wanted to feed back on this um, setting up of a, a Teams site for every um, new project or engagement and just wanted to give a little bit of feedback about our experience um, with mm -hmm. that at Uniting. Um, so we we have adopted that um, approach for various little projects and working groups and we've got ourselves into a bit of a mess um, because people are creating groups and teams at a rogue level and um, it gets a little bit of uh, out of control when you're a member of like 40 different teams and no one remembers why they set something up in the first place. So we have a bit of a challenge to... Yeah, try and keep on top of the um, the team's creation. And we also don't have great um, like governance on who can create. Um, and yeah, just wanted to give you that feedback because um, we, we, we spiralled out of control with the amount of teams groups we, we have. Yeah. And Chantel, I think that's really a common thing. David, you are the expert on this. Can you, I'm sure you've got some governance guidelines that you can share. Yes. So, Beck, a couple of things we do. It's the project manager or the lead consultant's job to create either the new channel or the new team uh, at project initiation. So that it's not a free for all. Um, we might see on the internal channels, uh, within an internal team, channels created a little faster than uh, that, but it's not that big a deal, we seem to have managed it. Uh, sometimes people come into a, ch a channel to get a document. They're uh, in the project world, it might be uh, we're interacting with project managers and a few representatives from the customer, but they have stakeholders beyond the project who need to see a deliverable. Sharing with SharePoint, rather than bringing them into the team to see all the minutia that goes on day to day in the project works better in that case. So the feedback can come 
from the stakeholder without uh, the clutter and chatter of the project going along. Uh, on a practical level, and I think it, there, it might be on a slide, I also recommend regularly um, resorting your teams and hiding your channels. So if there's a, ch a, in our case, where we might work from project A to project B to project C, if A and B are to bed and happily accepted, I'll hide those channels so that I don't actually need to see them. Uh, at the end of a project, I'll hide a team as well if that complete engagement has been put to bed. So it's available, but I hide often. And I also uh, move my busy teams to the top of the list. Uh, and I'm asking myself, why do I have a project that closed last year uh, visible at the top of my list of channels rather than the customers I'm dealing with right now? Yeah, that's a really good practical point, Chantelle. Is that something that you could you know, try and implement is, is, and you can pin teams, is that right as well, David, the the top teams and then hide some of your others? Correct. So I, I've got pinned uh, my resourcing channel, uh, Team Awesome, so my key internal interactions, uh, and then I'll pin typically either by urgency or dollar value the customer channels that need the most attention so that if something's happening I don't miss it and mm. the reverse of that unpin uh, yeah. as as necessary mm. yeah. um David there's also a question from Beck in the chat saying are there any any great modern examples of the old collaboration contract to help teams facilitate and capture the conversation about where and how they agree to work, which is what we were talking about earlier, how you start off a project. Um, our champions and early adopters are keen for these types of resources. So in, a, in many of our engagements, we'll help customers through that conversation. It's not for Engage Square to say, here's how to set it up. Uh, but we, I can visualise uh, a typical deliverable of where do we work, or it's often called which tool when, uh, that the ground rules are laid for here is when it's appropriate to use OneDrive or Yammer or Team or email. And it's generally by consensus with a team is when those tools have some legs and keep going. Uh, if it's a poster on the wall, it may not last as long, or if it's an edict from far away. Uh, but the graphic itself, um, if, if you think one column is the icons of Teams channel, Teams uh, planner board, uh, to Yammer, to email, to OneDrive, to SharePoint natively, and then what works best for that group of collaborators and write it down and update it if it's not working or you find a better way. Mm. Keep coming with the questions, everyone. I just wanted to, on the screen now, David, just that last point about if anyone sends an email, then rather than post it in a Teams channel, then the email's immediately forwarded to the Teams channel and anyone um, who needs to be alerted is at mentioned. Does everyone know how to do that? Um, did you know you could do that? Um, and David, can you explain, you know, why you do that? And I think also, let's go back to that Menti poll that Emily did earlier. That the email overload was one of the it was it was the top issue people identified, or the top it's sin. Right up there with company-wide emails that ask, "Where are we going for lunch at 11:50?" A pain in my neck. And you've, I'm sure you've all seen that. Please take me off this thread, as they bounce around organisations. Uh, in if you get a message and as a project manager, I might get something that the lead consultant or the change consultant on the project needs to know. If I forward that into the channel, uh, mm. I can then tag whoever needs to see it. And that works both ways. Uh, an acceptance deliverable 
from a customer. We celebrate that by landing that in the team as well. Um, it lets conversation stay in place and avoid the plus one with a reply or that yeah. can uh, clutter an inbox. And then on the practical terms, if that was a real uh, Teams interface right now, a right click on the channel name, you can get the channel email address. And unless it's locked down for governance reasons, you can use that to send emails, um, send an email into the channel. Uh, we blind copy our status reports into a channel that uh, our management can see in one place all of the status reports landing and we scrape them up and then they're available through another tool for ready access on a project status report as an example with a little bit of automation from the platform. Mm, yeah, so look for everyone that's potentially one takeaway maybe you can take from this webinar is, um, you know, just to reduce email a little bit is forward that email into the Teams channel and um, hopefully that alone should start getting getting rid of a few emails. But David, I just want to go through the full circle. Um, so we've talked about, you know, establishing a team, um, creating, an, creating a team and then a new channel for each project. Your conversations are held in the channels, not in the chats. Um, you know, if emails come in, they're forwarded to the, the team. At the end of a project though, you use the M365 suite full circle. Emily, can you switch to the next slide please? Because you wrap everything up with a post on Yammer. Can you tell us about that? So by process, our project closure checklist has the expectation that we answer three very simple questions of uh, what did we learn? What did we do? I'm going to get to five questions. Uh, anything we can learn and a little bit of marketing knowledge. So on the right, uh, we ran a... I'll I won't name names, but that was Cricket Australia that we ran uh, <laughs> an Insights Discovery workshop for recently. Um, and that's new technology. Uh, I didn't put very many words out there. Uh, I made it a praise just to uh, just take a little bit of reflected glory from the work of others uh, and some screenshots were attached from the report, which uh, that knowledge sharing in the organisation, um, we've done something new with this customer that hasn't been done before and uh, it it's a lot of traction. Uh, the other reason I almost always put a screenshot of what happened in one of those posts is someone will ask for it, that there's curiosity and uh, it's not a case study, but it's a really fast showcase of work that has happened. And when we're clo closing down as many projects as we do, um, it's almost always the, the best of what's happening. And yeah, this... This, real, this practice really stood out to Laurie and I because it was really sharing that knowledge across the organisation. So, you know, ultimately by posting at Yammer with all your, your learnings at the end, it's, it's part of organisation-wide social learning, I guess. Absolutely. And um, yeah. the little slide on the left, um, I, I, I just fill that down. Uh, a hashtag by process. Um, let it stand out that that's not a random hashtag. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I meant, did mean to say that we done good um, hashtag that is used for all of these um, final posts at the end of a project and using data from Swoop. I know it. Or it usually you were telling us it shows up as the number one hot topic on your Yemen network. Just about okay. always. <laughs> So let's just move to, oh, look, Angus Florence is just coming in. Angus, you've just missed us talking about um, full, coming full circle on Yammer. <laughs> but let's move on to the next slide, which is um, just some top tips from David as well to take away. So you've already touched on some of these, but can you explain these top tips, David? And I'm hoping that there's some good takeaways for everybody. So in our context, dealing with a variety of customers, it's almost always possible to grab the icon from their website and 
label the team so that there's a visual cue to give attention to what needs attention. Uh, I mentioned slow moving teams to the bottom. Um, and by arranging teams, we'll have an internal and an, an external channel if we're hosting the shared environment. Um, keep those together, that an internal at one end and a random arrangement for the external focus won't always be there. And uh, I don't know everything about everything, uh, but being able to see what needs attention um, really helps for me. Uh, and a simple example, Beck, seeing your question, um, if that was something I didn't want to respond to here, I would often cut and paste your question, uh, find the right channel, paste it in, and then at whoever's asked it the answer. And I will always politely say when I do that, I'll answer in the channel. And that's a little nudge to stay away from chat. Uh, and sometimes that works really well, but um, if I've got a project or multiple projects with the same lead consultant, sometimes the chat works well, but um, generally uh, put the conversation where it needs to be. One final thing, I know we spoke about this when we were doing the interview for the case study, David, is you sort of have a rough rule about percentages. What do you work in channels? What do you work in chat? Um, increasingly, and I'm trying to drive more and more channel conversation. Um, we discussed, Sharon, and I'm not going to uh, do it right now because I'll break the windows, but if you imagine looking at your chat list right now, uh, I caught at when we were talking last week, uh, I could only go back to about three o'clock yesterday to see the most recent, uh, and ch any chat below that was lost to me and not getting my attention. So uh, yeah. there can be a lot of chats below the uh, visible frame, um, and I may or may not give those the right amount of attention, but I will routinely scan my channel list and look for notifications there. Um, and on the fatigue in my team's rail, notification fatigue, I've moved, uh, I think your default is activity at the top, then chat, then teams. I've shuffled that so it's teams chat activity that I choose when I look at a notification, not mm. the beeping screen. Mm. We'll do that after this for everyone as an exercise. Jump onto your chat page on Teams and see how long, like David said three o'clock yesterday, his cuts off, but how long on the actual screen before you've actually got to scroll, start scrolling through your chat. And it sort of gives you an idea of how much attention you're going to pay to those chats. So um, I think what we were talking about, what Ruby was saying in the case study was aim for 80% working out loud with channels. And then the chats are purely about where do you want to go for lunch? That's where they lie. Or, you know, if you've got five minutes to catch up now, it's not about doing your work in chat. And if that does become work in chat, moving that into the channel. So um, I'm just looking at the time. Emily, I'm handing straight back over to you. David, thanks so much. Keep popping the questions in. All good. Thanks, Sharon, and thanks, David. Yes. Um, as we've mentioned, there are lots of actionable things that you can probably do as soon as you jump off today's webinar to make that much more manageable for you and easier to collaborate in your teams. Um, of course, lining up with that final key finding that Laurie spoke to earlier, um, we find that there's increasing importance um, and a need to analyse what this looks like within your organisations as well, which is why we wanted to take a few minutes to show you how you can look to see uh, what these collaboration habits look like for in your own organisations and how you stack up to uh, some of the benchmarking that we've run as well. Uh, so at this point, I'm just going to quickly navigate across into Swoop, uh, sorry, not Menti, uh, we're going to be jumping into Swoop for M365. I know that some of you are 
very familiar with these dashboards and you're using Swoop for M365 right now. But for those who haven't seen it, this will be a really sort of quick overview about how you can measure these collaboration habits, how it looks like for yourself as an individual, but then also being able to see how this looks like across your entire organisation and then also being able to segment down. So when you first log into Swoop for M365, you know, this is just a, a demo site that we're looking at at the moment. So if you can maybe sort of visualise and have a bit of a think about what some of this data would say for yourself as an individual and the way that you use M365, and maybe also what it looks like for your broader organisation. And, and maybe those results will look um, a little bit different to the demo data that we have here today. So, of course, you know, being Swoop, we always love seeing the change at the individual level, which is why we have the personal dashboard, as always. Um, you also have the ability to segment, which is, you know, where you can pinpoint those high performing departments or groups or teams across your organisation and see what that sort of culture is around the way that those people work. And then also being able to look at it at the enterprise level. I'll just briefly show you here, for example, if, you, if I were sort of looking at this and pretending that I am, you know, Frankie, uh, I can very quickly see some of those quick insights and tips for myself and the way that I could maybe slightly shift the ways that I collaborate to improve, the, uh, improve these scores across the board. So I can see, for example, you know, I'm doing a really great job on the chat liberated measure and also the screen sharing measure. But then I'm also given this slight nudge to maybe think about uh, turning my camera on a little bit more in Teams meetings to make it a little bit more engaging. And then you can also sort of unlock your own personal achievements, uh, depending on which of the collaboration habits uh, increasing or decreasing over time as well. But I might jump into the collaboration habits on the enterprise level to just to quickly show you. So your entire organisation and the way that you use M365, uh, you're given an overall collaboration score, which is where it's sort of averaged out against the seven collaboration habits that if, you know, if we go back to the uh, sort of Menti poll that we ran at the start, we had those sort of seven digital sins. It's all lining up with these collaborate, seven collaboration habits you see in the dashboard here. So for today, I know we've been focusing in quite a lot on the email liberated part, also a little bit on the asynchronous collaborator part. But I can see for this organisation, they're doing an extremely good job on that email liberated habit. And that quite simply means that the balance between relying on email versus using channels and Yammer potentially to collaborate is, is spot on, um, even performing sort of right up in the top end of, of the benchmarking that we've ran. Then alongside all of these habits, when we click into view the insights, we get a more detailed view of what that ratio actually is for your organisation. So we can see for this, this demo data, uh, people are sending less than one email for every Teams channel or Yammer message. And when we go back to some of those uh, sort of ROI type calculations that you can make if you're moving some of those email conversations across into Teams or into Yammer, there's massive time savings and then also massive cost savings to be unlocked as a result. So I'd really encourage that you have a look at those calculations and what it might look like for your organisation. Even if you very conservatively move 20% of those emails across into channels or into Yammer, uh, what, is, what is the potential time saving if you then look at that across your entire organisation? So then we sort of start to get into ways that you can improve, Similar thinking, of course, as you start to move down to these different habits as well. So we can see people are spending 31 minutes in Teams meetings versus every uh, Teams channel or, or Yammer message as well. And we have those sort of what good looks like insights built into the tool as well that come from our, our benchmarking study too. So you can see what those, those benchmarks are that you can start to aim for. But I think something that we also know as, as we talk to organisations and we have um, some customers running with these insights, we know that there are some parts of the organisation that will really struggle to sort of unlock those higher scores across these habits. But in saying that, these habits and looking at it and breaking it down by these, you know, seven different habits, 
it's a much more powerful way to get people to think about the way that they're currently working and what those tiny shifts might look like to sort of create that broader change across your entire organisation. But then we can also then go into, you know, some of those department based insights if you're wanting to see, you know, which parts of our organisation have that balance right across the board. We can see here that, you know, finance, professional services and head office, they seem to be registering quite high scores, but then you could also look at that across, you know, job title, as, as Laurie mentioned, you know, we find that leaders as a part of this study were actually um, showcasing some of those really great collaboration habits across the board, uh, you know, potentially location or whatever other, you know, attribute data you have. But you can also then sort of take those insights on the habits and then start to really drill down on some of those usage metrics as well, just at a glance. And the great thing about being able to see this in Swoop for M365 is that, I guess, historically, usually it would only be sort of your M365 admins that would be able to have access to this type of insight. So if you can imagine being able to see this on the personal level or if it's, you know, department based, um, if you're, you know, a Swoop admin, potentially you might want to be logging in and seeing this across the entire organisation. If you can sort of pinpoint that opportunity to say that, um, you know, you need to improve on the email liberated measure and you're wanting to improve on the asynchronous collaborator habit, then you can go into these usage analytics and see how those trends shift over time as well. So ideally, you'd be wanting to see the Teams audio and video start to decline. Same goes with the emails. And then hopefully you're seeing more of that collaboration happening within channels or potentially in Yammer. And the same sort of thinking applies to some of the other habits that we look at around file sharing. And I, I think it was quite interesting that I think that was maybe the third uh, most prominent sort of digital sin that we're seeing across the board for the people uh, in this call today. So then you can start to see, you know, what is that balance between the SharePoint and OneDrive? And I think for this organisation, because these are quite similar, when we go into the habits, we can see maybe that is one of the that is the habit that we need to focus on the most around being a, fi a better file sharer and working in those more open collaborative spaces. That is my very super quick crash course in Sweep for M365. And if any of this is a little bit intriguing to you or if you're keen to see what your email liberated score is for your organization or your asynchronous collaborator score, you can run a free trial of Sweep for M365. And um, if you are interested in that, please feel free to reach out to me. There's lots of great information on the website as well. Alongside running a free trial, you can also receive a, um, uh, we do a, a custom benchmark report as well for your organisation. So we can help to pinpoint those sort of segments or, you know, if it's a department or a group or a team that are the high performers. And that's all something that um, Laurie helps to produce for you. So that's all sort of a free service that we offer. If you're interested, please, please do get in touch. Um, we are sort of in the, sorry, Sharon, did you have? Yes, we have got a question from oh. Anne Therese just about how um, Swoop for M365 differs from Microsoft Viva Insights, which is a great question. Yes, it is. And, I, and did you drop that? Um, we have a one pager that has been dropped into the chat as well. Yeah, and I yes. guess just with time, maybe you could follow this up directly. Mm -hmm. with there's, a, there's a section in the report. There's a section in the report that we address that exact issue because it's been asked several times before so, so uh, we'll direct you that way great thanks all good thank you so much um so i just had one final uh menti question i know we're sort of on the half hour but if you wanted to just jump back in again using that qr code or if you already still have it open on your phone uh, maybe I can jump back across in here and move into the next question. Um, we just wanted to know which of these insights that we've spoken to today are most relevant for you. Um, so this is kind of going back to the insights that we spoke to at the start of the session. Uh, you know, is it the all the gear, no idea that seems to be resonating in your organisation? Um, are Teams channels in Yammer are more underutilised? Are people focusing more on the email? chat interruptions, uh, that there's a big variation in the collaboration habits. I think I've given you the ability to select multiple as well if, if there are a few that are ringing true for you. 
Um, so potentially, and, and we'd love to see you sort of sharing some of these insights as well within your organisations, and please do uh, refer to the uh, insights in the report as well and share the, the link to the report around as well. It looks like it's pretty even across the board because we also ran a, a similar session uh, for some of the other regions in the US and in Europe, and I think there was it wasn't as evenly split as this one, so it's great to see that um, I guess there's all of these are resonating on some level. The the leaders demonstrating better collaboration habits than non-leaders isn't getting any love there at the moment. So um, I think that was actually one of the more surprising insights that, that I th th uh, thought came from the report as well. So thank you for your for your in your, your input there. Of course, if you haven't had the uh, opportunity to download the report just yet strongly encourage you do. There's a wealth of great insights in there, including a lot of the uh, sort of key findings that we've spoken to today. Of course, more case studies with some of the high performers and collaboration champions. Uh, and as I mentioned, please do share the report far and wide because there's lot, it's, it's full of great stuff. So QR code there on the screen. If you missed that, of course, you can just head to the Swoop website and I'm sure you'll very quickly find how you can access the report there. It, it's free to download as well. And that brings us to the conclusion of today's session. Um, thank you so much to anyone who asked a question or made a comment in the chat today. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, I'm sure we can hang around for a few extra minutes and have a quick chat. Um, but otherwise, it's been lovely to have you all. Thanks so much for joining. And I will see you in our next webinar. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye.